Okay, in this video I just want to go over a couple more problems here involving um, amino acids and peptides and that sort of thing. So I decided to change this problem up a little bit. It says draw the tetrapeptide tyrosine, I'm going to use glutamine, I'm going to use lysine, and I'm going to use valine as mine as opposed to what's in the problem because several of those amino acids I've already covered. And it says draw this peptide at pH of physiological pH and again that's pH 7.4 so to begin with I'll draw NH3 plus over here CH I'm going to leave tyrosine even though we've covered this quite a bit in other videos so it just has the benzene ring a CH2 and the OH here at 7.4 it's not going to be deprotonated because the pKa of the side chain is 10.5 so we draw the C double bond O and then we show the peptide bond here and the next amino acid that I have is glutamine so I'm going to draw that that's CH2 CH2 C double bond O and that's an NH2 on the end here. Now we keep going here. C double bond O, NH, and the next one is lysine, and that is CH2. I'm going to abbreviate this. It's CH2, four of those, and NH3 plus. Again, there's a positive charge on there because this only loses a proton at a pKa of about 10.5 as well. And just for reference, this nitri this uh, amine group on the end here would lose its hydrogen at a pKa of about 8.5. That's roughly speaking. And the last one from this group is going to be valine. So that's CH, CH3, CH3. And on the end here, we'll have a C double bond O, O minus. And that, and for reference, this one loses its hydrogen or proton at about pKa of 3.5. So that's the tetrapeptide that I was hoping to draw. So I wanted to do question B here. Um, but I kind of wrote over it, so I'm just going to read it to you. Indicate how the structure and charge change, if at all, in, if, if the solution pH were 12. So what they're saying is now we're at pH equal to 12. So how will that change the above tetrapeptide? Well, I'm not going to redraw the whole thing. I'm just going to briefly explain what would happen. Remember that the tyrosine over here has a pK r equal to 10.5 so this hydrogen would be lost this group over here has a pKa of about 8.5 so that would be this would wind up being NH2 and not NH3 would no longer have the positive charge nothing would happen with glutamine here that's an NH2 on the end nothing would happen with glutamine with lysine again that's a pKr of about 10.5 so that would also lose the proton and become neutral. Um, valine is hydrophobic amino acid and nothing's going to happen there and this carboxyl, carboxyl group on the end here that's just going to have um, lose the proton early on at a pKa of about 3.5 so nothing really changes with that one so the changes are here with lysine over here with tyrosine which loses its proton on the side chain and also this amine group on the end loses a proton so those would be the three changes that would occur in this um, tetrapeptide if it were at pH 12 so moving on to the second question here it says describe the origin of London dispersion forces and I talked briefly about this before 
in another video, and I'm not going to go into too much depth here, other than to say that London dispersion forces are the weakest of the intermolecular forces. And at any given point, a nonpolar bond can exhibit polar character caused by unequal distribution of electrons about the bond. So this unequal distribution of electrons about the, about the bond can look something like this. You can, if you were ever asked to draw this on an exam, you say CH3R, and we'll just arbitrarily say that this is a delta positive here and a delta negative here. And we'll do the same thing again, draw another one of these molecules. And this is just maybe, a, maybe an alkane or something like that. And this will be a delta negative and a delta positive. So that's what this nonpolar bond exhibiting polar character would look like. Um, it's like a temporary induced dipole. And this is an attractive force, however weak that may be. So let's see what else I have here. This one's good as well. I think this is worth looking at. It says draw a plausible hydrogen bonding structure between the side chains theranine and histidine. Identify the donor and acceptor. Okay, this is good for what we've been covering here. It's another amino acid um, problem, so let's start drawing it. So I have NH3 plus CHCOO minus and I'm going to draw my histidine first. So that's CH2. This is a C. This is a C. There's a double bond here. This is another nitrogen here. We have a nitrogen up here. That also has a hydrogen attached to it. Another, another carbon up here. CH, and that's attached like that. And there's a double bond between the CH and the N here. So that is the structure of histidine. And I'm drawing it at physiological pH here, so 7.4. And I'm also going to do the same thing with aranon. So that is NH3, CHCOO minus, and this is CH, CH3, and over here is OH. And basically what you could do is just show a hydrogen bonding by showing this dotted line between the nitrogen on histidine and the hydrogen of theranine. And if I were to label the donor and the acceptor, well, this is the donor, the weakly acidic donor, and this is the acceptor. And that's a weakly basic acceptor and the lone pair. So the next question is about the hydrophobic effect, and I explained that in another video. So I'm not going to do that one here. The bottom one says, what are the conditions on which delta G, what are the conditions for delta G to be spontaneous, essentially? Um, well, that's not really all that hard. I don't know if how much, you know, your particular professor will want out of this question that you can go a little bit more in depth. But I would just say that delta G must be negative. So a negative delta G indicates a spontaneous reaction. If it's positive, it's not spontaneous. So it's just kind of a very basic concept. And we'll do more on uh, Gibbs free energy later on. It becomes more important later in the course. Now, this is a three-part question, and I don't want to draw the titration curve at this point because I'm going to do a complete video just on titration curves. Um, but I will answer the first question because I think it's kind of important to understand about buffers. And it says, over what specific pH ranges could malonic acid be used as a buffer? And justify your answer. Well, there's not really much to this. I just want to kind of give the basic you know, generalization of how to go about thinking about this. Well, it shows up here that malonic acid is a dicarboxyl, carboxylic acid, with a pKa of 2.82 and a pKa2 of 5.7. So we have two pKa values, and the thing to remember about where these are like 
where these would be good buffer, where mu maximum buffering ability will be. The maximum buffer, uh, buffering ability will be when the pH is equal to the pKa. So the best places for this to buffer would be when the pH is equal to 2.82 and when the pH is equal to 5.70. So those would be the two cases where it would have maximum buffering capacity. Um, but also, as a rule of thumb, this is, this is kind of general and, and not, you know, steadfast rule, but the pKa or the, or the range over which this can act as a buffer is usually between plus or minus one pKa unit. So maybe, for example, this one over here has a maximum buffer in capacity at 5.7, but that could extend from about 4.7 to 6.7 as far as its um, ability to act as a buffer. And we're definitely going to go over how to draw the titration curve because that's something you'll probably see on an exam or be asked to do at some point in one of your classes, especially this biochemistry class. Um, and the one on the bottom says for 15 moles, that's another, that I, I solved quite a bit of these acid base problems so I'm not going to solve this one at that point, at this point. So um, good luck and thanks.